Hey there everyone, Leaf Reed here, and uh, today um, I guess I'm going to talk about uh, parkour <laughs> civilization. <laughs> and this is actually kind of great because this is a, a, a series of uh, videos I guess I wanted to do about media that I don't think is necessarily good. Well, <laughs> it, it's media that, um, how would I say it, the medium is atrocious but the actual content is really well done and so some things you know in this uh, area are things like Tales Gets Trolled which I was shocked at uh, I would say even My Little Pony um, and parkour um, civilization is now part of that little family and I'll get to those you know eventually um, but what is it about parkour civilization that makes it so strangely addictive and I think a lot of people in the comments they're surprised like oh wow you know I'm X age, I shouldn't be watching Minecraft videos like this anymore, but I'm really enjoying this. This is actually really good. And so, to that extent, you know, um, what parkour fantasy or parkour fantasy, it's like Final Fantasy, uh, parkour civilization is, is that um, it's just a very well written, well paced uh, story. And definitely with undertones of shonen vibes because. I don't know if this is something that kind of lends itself to the idea of video games and telling stories in video games, but one of the kind of tacit or implicit things that games are able to do is that games work on a level of structures, rules, levels, and so on, and you can just tell almost a story with numbers. You know, uh, you know, there's a level 7 guy, there's a level 5 guy, and how can a level 5 guy beat the level 7 guy? And he finds some weird exploit and finds some trick. And so it's interesting how the, I don't know, the experience of playing a game and the kind of the underlying story, the gameplay story, is also uh, running alongside the actual uh, narrative story. So, you know, you have something like a, I don't know, this always comes to mind, like Devil May Cry 3, for example, where you have Dante and his story, and he's, you know, going after Virgil and just, you know, learning all these new crazy moves. Um, and so there's that story that kind of slowly, um, you know, re reveals itself. It tells a little bit of backstory. You know, Dante he goes through some ups and downs or whatever. But the gameplay story is that every single level you're getting a new weapon, a new side weapon, a new move, a new unlock, a new skill that you use to level up. And so, you know, the gameplay story is that you're collecting this uh, collage of different items and tools at your disposal that you can eventually use to defeat uh, the final, you know, boss, basically. And very rarely is the story of the game about, like, the, the actual gameplay elements. And so here in, you know, parkour uh, civilization, those elements of the experience of playing a game are totally implemented. And it's almost like the elements and the actions come first, and then the story comes in to kind of define and describe it. So the main thing about uh, this miniseries is that, uh, I mean, it's two hours long. Um, I actually played at like 1.25 speed since it's, you know, Zoomer Media anyway, might as well speed through it, which, you know, kind of sped up the process a little bit. Um, but as like a core movie experience, it's really good. And what it is, is that it has pacing. It has amazing, incredible pacing. And this goes to show that like, it does not matter if you are making Skibbity Toilet YouTube shorts, if you are making, in fact, Skibbity Toilet, I hate to ugh, say it, but um, kind of has the same kind of vibe, not exactly in the pacing department, but in the, well, actually, yeah, in the pacing department, and in the, what would you call it, um, the power leveling department and, and scalability, where, you know, you have... Uh, and you know, you know, you, you just have to watch it if you don't know what I'm talking about. But you know, you have the the toilets who kind of excel in one aspect of you know technological warfare, and then you have the cameras that excel in another aspect. And one finds an exploit. And what I love actually about uh, Scooby Toilet is that it's completely uh, nonverbal storytelling. Like you just see these battle sequences, and you see the characters figure out, oh, if we use this method against these guys, then this will happen. And they realize, oh, if we, you know, they then end up using that method against them, or they or it backfires somehow. And you have like 
four or five different arcs. And I actually, I, I just actually, I do love, I don't really like Scooby Toilet, but I actually do enjoy the actual format of the show because it's, it's all show and no tell. And if you can do that, if you can tell a somewhat, I mean, that, that, that is the problem with Scooby Toilet is that it's not a super complex story. It's like, you know, one guy is fighting, like one civilization is fighting another civilization. Like that's really it at the end of the day. Um, but if you could do something like deeper, like what if there were, I don't know, two characters in love or, you know, someone had to go find something or there's like a hero's journey kind of thing, that would be a little bit more advanced. But I do enjoy it for what it is in the, in the sense that it is a completely visual storytelling that always keeps upping the ante with very noticeable time skips. You know, it'll just cut to like an invasion of something. I remember when I, the first Scooby Toilet video I saw was uh, Scooby Toilet 50 or something, like the invasion. And I was expecting, I, well, I didn't know what to expect, right? And it's just a bunch of explosions and like alarms going off and you see like this fleet coming in. I was like, okay. It's like if you took, um, I don't know, some kind of action movie or an action scene and you just divided like a minute of the action and then like skipped and then like to the next action scene. It's really interesting. And again, I do appreciate it. I do appreciate it for the fact that it's able to do completely visual storytelling. But anyway, back to Parker Fant uh, Parker Civilization. The, the, the thing that I like about it or the thing I don't really like about it is that, you know, they're using Zoomer style editing where, you know, the guy's talking really fast. He's like, oh, how can I do this? How can I overcome this? Whatever. And he has like the typical, you know, narration. And then you have the other, you know, voices in the production production. And, like it's just his friends like voicing things. It's very like low quality and it has that low quality soul to it. It has something that really makes it shine through and in the first five minutes of watching this thing i thought there's no way there is no way this is i'm gonna like this or it's gonna be good because the same it's the same youtube format that i'm just used to where some, some guys talking about oh guys i found this one weird exploiter this one crazy thing and we're gonna find out what it is and they like bait you on through the whole video until you watch at the end i don't i i, I don't watch minecraft uh, YouTube videos, except for the ones where they uh, are griefing or rage quitting. Um, I just didn't grow up in that generation, and I, I don't know if I'd watch it even if I did. But um, what's interesting is that within the first five minutes, there's a development where you're introduced to the world, you're introduced to the fact, okay, you have to parkour everywhere, like, okay, great, how long is this going to last? And then suddenly there's a development where suddenly, and this is really interesting from a storytelling perspective, where you know, he's given the choice, the character's given the choice where he can choose to uh, jump one block forward for a piece of uh, chicken, I think, and then, you, or you can do, um, you know, a higher block for the beef, and obviously that gives you more um, stamina points. And so suddenly, the character is in a predicament where they have a choice, and this is a really interesting way to just kick off this little series is like, okay, here's a dilemma. Like, what do I do? If I go for one thing, um, you know, it's easy and I'll get a war. And if I go for the other thing, I run the risk of falling down. And what's really cool is that it's completely a mystery as to what is down there. And, and it's so interesting that this was obviously made as like a mini series thing because they're obviously building out this world as they're doing it. And each sort of isolated short or video is essentially its own short story where they have, uh, you know, conflict, well, problem, conflict, and resolution all in the same kind of small scope. And then you just keep increasing that scope. And for those of you who haven't seen it or will refuse to watch it, um, it's essentially a Minecraft world, but there's essentially, it's just, um, it's mostly air. And there's just blocks and kind of like a checkered pattern in between. And so the, the idea is that you have to parkour everywhere. And then they do the, the biggest thing where, like, I, I don't... It, as I describe this on camera, it sounds like the dumbest thing that would make me turn off, like, the YouTube video. But it actually works, where their currency is parkour. So not only do you have to, you know, jump for your food and then also do like exercises for the day, but then you have to also, uh, you know, like in order for um, 
to like get past some guys or bribe some people or whatever uh, he ends up doing um, 360 jumps, backwards jumps, and this is the one thing he's really good at that no one else can do. And so he's able to kind of make his way uh, through the whole system and whatever. And so, you, they, again, each story kind of reveals a mechanic, a new aspect of the world. And again, the mechanic comes first, like, oh, I can 360 jump. And then the story is kind of written around that. So, And I just love that idea because... Again, if you can make a story about a choice between jumping between a piece of chicken and a piece of beef and make it at least somewhat interesting and just recycle that, you're like you're golden. And again, and, and again, I love the fact that they introduce the mechanic first. They introduce uh, the stakes and the risk. So everything is a risk. Everything is a choice of the character. And so you're always watching to check if the character is going to make the choice you would make and so that kind of hooks your attention again this thing it's it's so painfully simple but so painfully effective and i think the worry or unfortunate truth is that a lot of people are just going to copy paste this that might be a good thing it might be a bad thing um for every near automata there is a stellar blade i haven't played stellar blade but it looks really good and it's done very well but it is still mostly just riffing or you know homaging or whatever to this other game but i digress um but yeah there's just you know this 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 little like youtube view it's just pure soul it's just pure production and so as the series goes on it turns out that there are multiple layers to this parkour civilization another thing i just do have to compliment the creators on is that they don't make it go on forever there is like an end point there is a, a finished ending and they don't like kind of milk it um forever as what scooby might feel like um and so again here's the other thing so not only do you have a risk and a choice associated with each episode but there's also mystery and so the mystery is that you know there's this temple and apparently within the temple once you get up to the top of it you get to the next stage of civilization of the parkour <laughs> civilization and so you as a character essentially have to ascend through, you know, well, not you as a character, you're watching the character, but it feels so interactive because, again, there's all these uh, choices and deliber deliberations that he has to make, and you kind of feel like you're there with him making those choices. And what's really interesting is that a lot of the time, like, they are not afraid to have the character fail or have the character make the wrong decision and then they're in a new situation and then suddenly they have to work their way out of that one and there's always some way that the character can figure out to get, how to get out of that situation and it makes me think about you know a lot of people compare this kind of storytelling to shonens and st stuff like that <clears throat> and it makes me think if Shonen's just really work the same way. They would be like weekly releases of a bunch of characters who, you know, you, they have an established universe, an established rule set, powers, powers, etc. And it's just like, okay, what kind of situation are we going to put them in? Once you've established the, the world and the characters as fast as you can, you just kind of throw them into new situations. And really, that's what Shonen's really are. If they're like, no. Naruto or Bleach, it's like, okay, well, there's this character, and he has this power. So it's it's the same kind of thing, and I feel like, um, you know, with this Minecraft thing, I don't think they were super cognizant of the whole shonen arc. I don't think they studied it. I think this was just a natural thing that occurred. It seems very organic and unforced. I mean, maybe they had some idea of it, but again, I, it feels so genuine to me, which is why I really enjoyed watching it. I love genuine content, even if it's cringe-inducing, because eventually we get things like this, which is kind of cringe-inducing at the beginning, but it hooks you, and you get invested. So... Um, yeah, there's just a few elements that are just like swimming in the soup. And I think that the hardest part that at least I've seen with people who write short stories is that trying to string them all together. Like, you know, Lovecraft is great because, you know, he's able to like do this, you know, this setting, this whatever. Sometimes he recycles ideas like the Necronomicon. I think that like pops up in a few of his stories, but mostly each one of those are, they're all kind of self isolated they're not connected in any way there's no overarching thing and so you know similar to an episode tv series like the x-files uh Mulder and scully you know they kind of go through each kind of scenario but again there's an overarching thing and this one it just feels more 
driven. And so you, so the, the elements are you have uh, risk, choice, and mystery. And so, I mean, it's just good. I, it's just, it's like uh, Arsene Lupin and like all of these other serial kind of ser uh, series. Um, anyway, I'm just kind of analyzing that myself now as, I, as I'm realizing it. Um, and so, so what occurs? So as the uh, main character, Evob or something, goes through each one of the challenges and scenarios, uh, so yeah, there are different levels to the whole civilization. This is spoilers if you don't want to know it. But, so you have the, the first plane, which is the noob level, and they only have like wooden houses, and um, you then have, you know, uh, he eventually, I think my favorite part in the whole series is that he goes through this whole process to get a ticket for an opportunity to go to the higher levels. So he goes inside the temple, and as he's about to take his first step in, into the trial to ascend through the temple, he ends up falling on his first step like a total noob. So the first time he's actually trying to test himself and his, and his uh, goal is right in sight, he trips and he descends into the underworld essentially, or what they call parkour prison. And so in this world, it's kind of like, um, you know, a lot of people <laughs> compare this to Donnie's Inferno. And so when he's in this area, um, it's kind of like they make them do ridiculous um, challenges where they have to do super hard things like jumping on, uh, what was it, fences and glass pieces which are super narrow and super just hard and they have to keep bouncing in their cage, uh, you know, continuously. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and, and then if you fall there, then you go into the lava and then you're really dead. But what I love about it is that, again, it's a total mystery as to what's below or above until you get there. But it's always teased as a horizon. Oh, the character is going to get here. And so for probably the first 20 minutes or so, I just kept watching because I did want to know what the second level of this world was. I actually cared because it, 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 it was teased to me and it was this whole idea of ascension. And so... Um, as someone who has read the Divine Comedy, <laughs> how well <laughs> does uh, parkour uh, civilization uh, fare up with the Divine Comedy? Um, not really, honestly. Uh, in the sense that once you're in hell, you can't really get out. The only reason that Dante can is because he's not from there. He's not actually in hell because he didn't do anything wrong. And so even then, Virgil, I believe, you know, he leaves him once he exits hell. And there's only, like, one level there. In fact, if anything, I would say that uh, the whole thing is ironically more similar to Umineko. Because on, in Umineko, you have different layers of reality where you have uh, kind of normal reality and then, you know, the courts or the world of witches and the courts of heaven. And even though you're able to ascend and move between these planes of existence, uh, the rules end up changing. So when he does it finally, you know, ascend to the second level, it's more like a city kind of thing. And so now, even though he's able to uh, essentially, he doesn't have to work all the time. Uh, it's it's semi-optional. He finds out, you know, what happens uh, when he doesn't work and he gets punished for it. But now every block jump is two spaces apart. But because he's now fed, he can actually do a sprint. And now that he has full you know, stamina, he can actually do a sprint jump. And that makes everything way easier. So again, I love this because it's taking the gameplay and using the gameplay as a, as, as a way to tell a story. It's so interesting that, hey, it's like, I don't know, it's similar to like, you know, skiing on a mountain where you might, you know... At the beginning day, you might start on like a, a blue course or a green course to like you know get get your um, ski legs back, and then you start moving on to um, you know uh, blue squares, and then you kind of finish the day with maybe like a black diamond or a double black potentially. And so it's it's kind of you know just again the mechanics are helping the author write the story, and it again this is something that is. I've tried to verbalize this phenomena, but it, it's like this self-player story where if you're playing an RPG that is very open-ended, like Morrowind or Skyrim or 
you know, um, Oblivion or, I mean, those are just all the Elder Scrolls, but uh, let's take those for example. Um, it's interesting because if you look at Morrowind compared to uh, Skyrim, let's say, Morrowind is more on the story, like, like you know, focused, narrow side, while Skyrim, the main story does not matter. It's all about the side stories and getting lost in the world, and it's so well done that they refuse to make a sequel. Uh, appropriately so, and people keep buying it. While Oblivion's kind of in the center, where it's like, yeah, there's a main story, but there's also all this other cool stuff to do as well. So, what's really interesting about those two games, Morrowind and Skyrim, is that Morrowind, I never, you know, and I didn't play it when it came out, so I, I played it much later, but I still loved it. But I never had the impulsion that, oh, I really want to explore the world of, of um, Vardenfell. It was just kind of like, the, the main story was so good, I was so satisfied, satisfied with it, I didn't feel the need to go out searching. And, and honestly, if I'm, uh, if I'm really being honest, it's because the journal system just it sucks. It's not like you d it doesn't keep track of individual quests it's just like one line of thing anyway and i'm sure there's someone who's going to comment and say oh well if you just do this one mod or you just do it you can enjoy these wonderful side quests in the dlc i i maybe one day i'll do it if people don't shut up about it <laughs> but be that as it may so with skyrim uh you you get these situations i've had these situations where i have very vivid memories about like the the armor I had, the class I was, the kind of own personal story I had crafted for myself, where you know, I mean, the dream of game development or the perfect RPG is that the the gamer using the tools of the game and the RPG elements is able to craft a character that is wholly unique to them, and you know, with the modding community, that's even exacerbated. Um, but it, it's interesting that there's a push and pull between these two aspects of. Um, again, uh, you know, streamlined, narrated stories that give you an idea and experience, and then just sandbox games, or as I have recently learned, Nintendo calls them garden box games. Um, so, and and this is true with every kind of you know crafting game like uh, Factorio or. Um, Stardew Valley or whatever, you, you boot up these games and you kind of have to write your own story for what you're doing. And I don't know, it's just such an interesting experience and mechanic that cannot be reproduced in any other medium. And I think parkour civilization is, an ex is a good demonstration of that kind of storytelling mechanic without someone having to have played a video game. It's demonstrating to them oh, we're pushing this um, story forward using the rules and the lore of the world. Um, kind of similar to Dark Souls in that the lore is kind of hidden in everything while in this game the lore is being currently discovered and developed and, you know, the pacing of it is it relies upon what you know and what you don't know. And so... Anyway, so once he gets to the second stage of reality, essentially, um, so everything is harder in some ways and some things are easier in some ways, but he still wants to kind of get to the top because his motivation was to, I think, just face the champion. He realizes that there's more than... He, he just knew that there was just one level above him, and then he realizes there's even more levels, and I believe he's actually punished and so what i really like again are the twists you know when he goes into the first trial he falls when he is banned from ever doing uh you know the trial again there's an old man who gives him a second ticket and essentially a second chance to do this um when he uh, you know finds out that he has messed up by not doing his duty uh then he gets Actually, what happens to him? He gets punished, but I don't remember how. Another another really great twist is when he came back to his original house after being in the master area, where he essentially finds out that the secret passage that he found behind uh, his door is completely barred up. Because I love it when... Uh, you know, you return to an old place and something has changed. Something that you thought 
someone didn't know they now know about and and it's been and i don't know it's just it's a it's a really great scene and again um it's so easily done and i guess this is why I mean, I've thought about this a lot before where, you know, people, they talk about game scenarios and using games to tell stories and fan fiction and stuff like this. But, you know, we live in this age where recording video for games is very, very easy. Um, you know, I think of uh, the old machinimas I used to watch, like Red vs. Blue, or even the more drama-focused ones like the Codex. And this almost kind of has the same energy of it. I mean, they still use the kind of annoying Zoomer speak where they're trying to, like, talk really fast and grab your attention. And they're also, um, you know, using Vine boom sound effects. And even I kind of realized they had a, a, a system where they have a positive boom and a negative boom where, you know, depending on the situation. And again, it reminded me almost of Ocarina of Time when you have certain um, noises or uh, sounds when you click A to continue the conversation and to end the conversation, and you press or you press B or something. And it's just interesting how everything's just started flowing and working in a kind of system. And again, I don't know if there are some people who are turned off with this form of storytelling, but I absolutely love it. I love it where, again, you can take literally small building blocks and start just telling a story about that small building block and then you add more and you tell the story about that scenario and again like this entire thing I was really really hooked because every new scenario they introduced made sense and it just wasn't stupid and this kind of storytelling is just I think lacking in general in the sense that everything has become so agendized now that no one can watch a story without being reinforced some kind of talking point or some kind of point of view and just instead enjoy the aspect of a character overcoming his his trials it's just super entertaining and it's positive that's the other thing i really want to stress with this whole like story is that it's a positive upward trend and yeah there are some obviously some you know low points when he gets defeated um there's even you know, and again there's certain aspects of the story that you know take from the hero's journey that you know, like the old wise guardian who helps, you know, guide him. Uh, you know, they have the uh, the all-important hero's downfall. You know, he eventually makes it all the way up to the fourth stage, more, <laughs> more or less, and he fights the champion, and the champion basically does an insane five-block jump, this in insane uh, twist where he cheats, and and the, he fa the hero falls all the way back down to the noob level. It's like it's all over... He's been defeated, and finally there's like a deus ex machina where literally the, the, the god of parkour literally shows up and gives him um, the tools he needs to, to climb back up and also to defeat his rival. So, and I, I'm trying to remember if there also was like a revelation moment at that point, which is also part of the hero's journey, but regardless, um, you know, so he ends up defeating all the trials and as he's ascending through each kind of stage of civilization there's also a uh, conspiracy at the top where they're trying to unfairly um, make him not proceed in that at every stage you know there's an inside guy who's making sure oh I'm gonna put TNT in this block or something so you can't even make it across or I'm gonna challenge you and so even though the guy's playing by the rules, they're still messing with him, and he's still overcoming them because he's he's just that good, and <laughs> he never kind of loses focus or loses um, heart, and he always just keeps going. And eventually, again, he makes it all the way to the top. He defeats uh, the champion, and all the different e even the the part where they throw him in the coliseum. That was such a shonen moment where it's like, oh, it's a tournament thing. And he's supposed to fight the champion, but they spend, like, three guys. They send three guys in front of him to make him waste his resources. And he still almost comes out on top. Um, and so it's just the story. It's, it's the underdog story. And you love to see an underdog, you know, go through all these trials, go through all these problems, and make it all the way to the top. While at the same time uh, having senses uh, a sense of mystery and mystique and freaking, like, Minecraft that's being narrated by a fast-talking Zoomer. I don't know um, if anyone else has noticed this, but I laughed really hard when I started... Uh, I was watching a few black-and-white movies a couple of days ago, 
And uh, I realized that the Zoomer speed of talking is very similar to like the 1920s and 30s, like the fast talking detective, like, see here, buddy, like that style of talking has just reemerged after almost a century, which is just very puzzling and interesting to me. I'm sure there's some YouTube short about some linguist talking about this, but you know, I digress. Anyway, so he goes through all the levels, he gets to the very top, and he realizes when you're at the very top and you become the champion, you make the rules of the society and you basically change everything. And so he goes back to the old man who essentially allowed him to, uh, you know, who gave him his ticket and he said, oh, I'm gonna make you the champion. He says, no, no, this is about me, this is about you. And you make the rules. And so it was very quick and ends very shortly, but he basically says, I'm going to, uh, essentially remake the rules so that there is still parkour but everyone gets a second chance essentially and again that's again a perfect hero's journey ending you've gone all the way to the top you've returned to the bottom and now that the world is just a little bit better for your struggle that now even if you fall off in the, in the parkour universe uh, you still get a second shot where you don't have to go to like a lower level or something. So he doesn't totally dismantle the system. And there's a lot of people who are saying in the comments, that, you know, joking, half joking, that, oh, we need to destroy the upper class. Well, that's not what the character actually does in the story. He still keeps the system in place because if the system was removed, then there'd be no incentive to do parkour. And so... <laughs> It's so stupid as I describe this. But, you know, and, and then it comes to the base question, is parkour useful? And there's this whole flashback where they have the king, who's not actually the champion, he's not in charge, who essentially, it's just like a stupid, like, guy moment in Minecraft where he's like, oh, hey, um, you know, there's no way you can jump four blocks, like that block to that block. And it's like, it's like yeah, I could do that. He's like, oh, yeah, like, show me. If, if you do it, I'll give you a diamond. And so he's like, okay. And so it takes him a couple tries, but then he does it. And the dude's so impressed that he's like, okay, cool. Wow, well, cool. Here's, here's my diamond then. So this is like a little anecdote, a little exchange between two gamers that is completely innocuous. It's probably happened multiple times in multiple scenarios. But they use this little scenario, this action reward, you know, exchange as the basis for an entire civilization, an entire story. And again, it's so stupid, but it, it, what makes it smart is the way it's executed. And I think my biggest takeaway from this is, you know, people are talking about, you know, class structures and systems and society and civilization and, you know, oh, we need to do something about it. Uh, my big takeaway is that you can take something as innocuous and as dumb as a Minecraft block jumping and turn it into an interesting, compelling story. And again, this is what the hero's journey is about. It's about a, a story that, as long as you hit the right beats and the right energy, you can tell a very compelling, very well-told story. I, it pains me to say this, but I wouldn't be surprised if this turned into a Minecraft movie or something. I mean, it's already, it's already, uh, kind of perfect as it is. The only thing that would, might make it better is that you take the dialogue and you just transform it into actual dialogue rather than like Zoomer YouTube hype speak. Um, that's the other thing I would do and add music and soundtrack. Uh, I know this is like a CG animated thing. Like I, I really, again, I really enjoy this kind of stuff. I really enjoy passion projects that accidentally step on the uh, you know, hidden mythological floor panels um, that transcend time. You know, uh, again, stories about anything can be impactful and meaningful if they follow the right formulas. And you think it's crazy how this little YouTube short is short and it's two hours, but it, how it's better than most Hollywood movies. Um, again, because everything is all about convincing people of certain agendas and it's it's very stupid uh, instead of just telling a good story it's like like that's the thing the propaganda isn't even isn't even good that's and the, the, you're competing with youtubers uh, minecraft youtubers that's that, that that's the whole point i guess um 
And I guess the other thing, too, that's interesting is, you know, does this reflect reality? Is the game rigged? Well, it is kind of rigged to a certain degree, but it shows how, again, and I feel like a lot of stories in Hollywood now are about this um, anti-spiritual power struggle. Uh, there's this one interview that maybe I'll talk about later, and, and if you've seen it, you've seen it. It's the guy who is a retired Hollywood like screenwriter, scriptwriter, and he says the main thing that's missing from Hollywood today is that the stories are not spiritual. And I just had no idea what he meant by that. And he goes on to say that, you know, when you don't have good and evil, when you don't have the absolutes struggling, even though it's hyper simplistic in some degrees, uh, if you don't have that, all you have is morally gray characters. You know, Ga uh, Lord of the Rings to Game of Thrones, you know, that is good versus evil. Uh, you know, a spiritual Christian diatribe, while Game of Thrones is just uh, a nihilistic Nietzschean will to power, uh, you know, a gray di diatribe where, you know, the good characters have bad qualities and the bad characters have good qualities. And that's also just part of good character writing, but there's no one in Game of Thrones who's really good. I mean, maybe Jon Snow, uh, Daenerys for most <laughs> of the of the show, um, and so, you know, you, when you, when you, uh, the point I'm trying to get to is that there's plenty of uh, movies and media that talk about class structure and we have to disassemble the thing. But what makes this piece of media different is that it's about positive movement. It's about, yes, they're cheating. Yes, they're coming up with all these bad things, but it's the obstacles are there to overcome. Uh, you know, I'm I'm just going to get through them. I'm going to use the difficulty. I'm going to persevere and keep a positive attitude no matter what. And yes, you know, the main character is saved many times through Deus Ex Machina or like just random chance and, and whatever. But again, we love seeing that story of, you know, of going through the different uh, class structures and the class uh, struggles really and realizing that even though he's getting to new points in the class structure, that it's still very difficult. I think my favorite thing is, uh, I, I, I guess this is kind of a very true reality, when he makes it to the master level, which is like the third level, and he goes to buy a house, the first, first thing he does, and he, he comes into the room that he usually buys the houses in, and they say to him, uh, so he says, okay, well, how much does it cost? And they say to him, how much do you think it costs? And so it becomes this thing where at, at the elite part of society, um, nothing has a fixed price tag. It's just like, how much are you willing to pay? It's like a mind game. And he says, this is ridiculous. And I feel that is in a certain way when you're like gambling or at an auction for something, when you're trying to, you know, you have so much material wealth that to ascribe it as a value to something you you have no idea and so it becomes much more mental much more um advanced and, m and much more dynamic and it's very funny again how um every person at each stage in the uh different dimensions or planes or classes um they're better off in some ways but they're also worse off in others and there's a point where the main character says you know I almost wish I had stayed in my noob village. I wish I had actually never gone on this quest because everything's so complicated now. Um, and again, it, it's again about ascending through this class structure, getting to the top. And and again, what's really interesting is that he doesn't totally disassemble it, uh, it at the end because he still values parkour. I, I you know, it, you could exchange parkour with any other thing you'd be like a strength and a shonen anime thing or whatever um <clears throat> so he doesn't totally disassemble the whole system because there is value and there is skill and he he makes it on his own will and on his own strength and by you know following the system's rules as they expect it to and just beating the system at its own game you know, he finds certain exploits somewhere when he needs to, but he's not negative and morose and, you know, he's all, you know, fussing, you know, messing about where he's like, oh, well, the whole thing is impossible, so I'm not going to try. No, he gets back up and he keeps trying. And it's such a, it's not even like a positive message. It's just positive to see that. It's it's fun to see it, that he keeps 
going back and fighting and you know it's the indomitable human spirit uh against the structure um yeah i i, I don't know I, I i love it it's it's a great simple story and again if you can do this with freaking minecraft you can do this with pretty much everything <laughs> um uh, Again, it's similar to the Divine Comedy when he, you know, reaches the end. I guess that would be close to, I guess, the uh, the Heavenly Paradise, the the Garden on top of Mount Purgatory. Um, I mean, I guess you could argue that it, it it's like Paradiso, but it, 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 Paradiso is so abstract that. It it and and there's no real struggle there to get there. But when he does get to the top, he has he's right at the control system of the universe and the society and the civilization. And you know he's basically become God, or you know not exactly God, but definitely the the controller of the civilization, but not of the physical world. So he can change the rules, but not the actual fabric of reality. And again, it just shows that you know everyone has their own problems, everyone has their own struggles to overcome, and it just gives you a glimpse into just really well done storytelling, and how yeah things are going to be rigged against you to stop you from getting to that next level to that different class, but if you are as reliable as or as uh, you know determined to get there, there is a way, um, and so yeah, and just never give up. Um, that's pretty much the main message of this little thing. Anyway, I we were joking in chat that, <laughs> that I should review this since I was like, fine, screw it. I will do it. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's pretty much it. Anyway, <laughs> um, I, I don't know what this will do to my viewership, but uh, you know, so be it. Um, anyway, great production. R really, really happy to watch it. And uh, this is the kind of stuff I love on the internet. You know, it did not, it did not take a lot of effort. I mean, probably it took some effort, but it did not take a ton of effort to make this. Um, anyway, guys, that's pretty much it. See ya.